Hi everyone, I'm Brian Edward Hurst, and I'm coming to you over ESP Radio, which is brought to you by ESPConnections.com. In past programs, I have talked about a very famous London medium that I felt everyone should know about, Mr. Leslie Flint. In my opinion, one of the truly great mediums of the 20th century. This afternoon, I have with me a guest named Ursula Rieg, whom I have known for many years, and Ursula had many experiences in the darkened seance room with the voice medium Leslie Flint. Quite an astonishing collection of stories she has to tell from time to time, and uh, I wanted to introduce her to you. So here is Ursula Rieg. Hello, Brian. Nice that you were able to join us, Ursula, this Thank afternoon. You. Thank you for and, asking me. Uh, oh, that's a pleasure. And uh, I know that uh, you are a great admirer, as indeed am I, of Leslie and the work he did for suffering humanity, because his gift was unique in that he was a physical medium who actually produced the old-fashioned stuff called ectoplasm from his left ear, and spirit doctors and scientists were able to manufacture a floating voice box in the air through which the spirits of the dead, believe it or not, were able to speak loud and clear and be tape recorded. All kinds of people came through, men, women, children, over the years. And you and I, of course, we both sat with Leslie a number of times. How did you first encounter Leslie? I was introduced to Leslie Flint through a fellow medium, and actually I was introduced to Leslie via his recorded tapes of communication. And in a way, I'm very glad that I had that experience first, listening to tapes rather than attending a seance. I got used to the subject matter. I got used to the type of communication. But it's very different when you're actually in a darkened room and this man sits there, doesn't move his lips, and the voices come out in the middle of the room almost above you. And you never knew who came through. You never knew who the message was for. You had to wait. All of a sudden, Mickey, his guide from the other side, came through and would elevate everyone and eliminate their anxiety because of his wonderful humor. He was a jolly joker, wasn't he, Mickey, the he newspaper the boy? Master of ceremonies, he yes, was. Yes, he was. Uh, one incident that happened as we were waiting for Mickey to come through it was dead silence, and people in the room started to tease him and say, Mickey, Mickey, are you there? And we're all waiting for a response, and out of the blue comes Mickey, and he says, you all thought I was dead, wasn't I? And we all chuckled, because <laughs> it just was a wonderful way for keeping us all on a humorous level. Yes, because people going to London, many of them were very nervous. They had to, they knew they had to sit in a pitch dark room and then they had to be prepared for these spooky voices to come through in the air. Yes. And uh, of course this little boy's voice would speak and he would joke and perhaps there was someone there he knew. I remember one of the tapes that I heard he was talking to a lady named Rose and he said, hello Auntie Rosie, she, I see you brought some new people with you. Better have a short session tonight so you can all get down to that cheesecake you brought. <laughs> Mickey was pretty much uh, aware who was in the room uh, even before it got started, I would assume. Yes. But what amazed me about Leslie is the way I understand it is that Leslie was the medium on this side of life, on Earth. Yes. And Mickey was actually the medium on the other side of life. That's a good way of describing it. And because very often his his vocabulary was way beyond what a little newspaper boy who died at the age of 10 or 11 in Camden Town, London, right. what he would have known. But Mickey has grown since that time. Yes, yes. And what amazed me is the subject matters that actually came through, the different subjects, whether it was religion or what actually goes on on the other side, how people live on the other side, what they do, yes. or they would give words of encouragement to people at the seance room, or make predictions. I know that uh, there was a woman, very famous, and her husband, who attended one of the seances, and Mickey told her that she was going to be writing a book, and she was really quite puzzled, because that really was not her realm of expertise, Artist expertise. Mm. and sure enough she started her first book then she wrote another one and one more and they've all been successful and they also encouraged her about other things that she was going to be doing 
Her husband, relatives from his side of the family came through, who actually encouraged him about the work that he was doing. I won't tell you the name of these two people. I'll keep that confidential. Oh, yes. But it was pretty remarkable, and it was quite accurate. Yes. You asked me, what was my first impression? Leslie was really a very unassuming man. He never really uh, had his ego blown out of proportion, in spite of the fact that his gift was so tremendously unique. When you really consider an independent, direct voice medium, I always joke and I say the man just basically sat there. He yes, basically he did. never did anything and the voices came through. But that's really not quite true because what Spirit World did is they utilized his ectoplasm. So in the beginning of a seance, he sat quietly, but I also watched him at the end of the seances when everyone gathered and he looked completely exhausted. Yes, he'd go he and lie spent. down for half an hour, wouldn't he, and have yes. his favorite cigarette. That yes. was his vice. He liked to yes. smoke. Yes. <laughs> and that's okay, too. We all have our vices Yes, in we life. do. Thank exactly. God. Exactly. <laughs> well, there were so many tapes of these voices that George Woods and Betty Green recorded when they interviewed the dead over so many years. I mean, they went to London for 50, oh, more than 15 years, and they interviewed all kinds of people, from Joe Soap to celebrities like um, Frederick Chopin and, uh, and George Bernard Shaw. Queen Victoria came through. I think exactly. I may have mentioned that, that the, the rumors about her medium, John Brown, yes. that there were rumors of, her, of, an, of an affair, which Queen Victoria came through with great shock and horror that there was never anything improper between my medium and myself, she hmm. said, <laughs> in her high-pitched voice. Exactly. And then John Brown came through with his Scottish accent, and he says, oh, he says, I knew I took advantage of her. I'd say to her, oh, sometimes, Victoria, you could, shouldn't have wear the old dress. It doesn't it suit you? But he said, you know, he could say things like that to her because he was her friend. Exactly. And when she died in 1901, she left behind a number of journals in which the seances were recorded with John Brown, bringing through marvellous evidence from her late husband, the beloved Prince Albert, the German prince. Now, you also were born in Germany, yes. weren't you? Yes. And, and in fact, the way Leslie actually got started with his work is he was only, I think, 18 or 19. He wrote, to his regret, only one book, his autobiography, Voices in the Dark, and he describes his impoverished childhood, and he actually was raised by his grandmother. He was a, what he called a latchkey kid. Yes. He had a wonderful hu sense of humor because he would say, I used to bury the dead. He actually was an undertaker, or bury the dead, and now they talk to me. <laughs> and his grandmother was pretty strict from what I read in his autobiography. Not much sense of humor. But those were tough times also. Mm, they were. And yes. Leslie had a letter that came to him one day, and his grandmother said, there's a letter for you in the foyer. And it was a letter from a woman in Germany, from Munich, who told him and encouraged him that he must develop this gift that he has. And Leslie said, I don't know where this woman got my name. I don't know how she knew of me. So surely there must be something to this, because prior to this, he went to a spiritualist meeting. And talking about how funny he is, in his book he actually described the only reason he went to the spiritualist meeting is because they served, uh, what is it, sandwiches? Sandwiches, And yes. tea. And tea. And he was very poor and he was hungry. Yes. And that's why he went there. And then that evening there was a woman, he sat in the last row, a woman at the front, this medium said, there's a young man here all the way in the back and he thought, surely this isn't me that she's referring to, and he really wanted to hide. Mm. But this woman said, there's a man in a cape here who wants to encourage you to develop your gift, in so many words I'm paraphrasing. Well, as it turns out, that man in spirit that this medium saw was actually Valentino. And Leslie and Valentino had close ties, apparently, as brothers in another life, I believe. In a past life, yes. That's what he was told by Valentino. Now, Leslie was only 18 or 19 when this happened. And so he had his little sandwiches. This woman spoke a few words of encouragement. And he walked home and he shook his head and scratched his head and said, Are they joking with me? Are they kidding with me? How could this be? Because she said, You're going to be well known. You're going to be doing very important work. And this is a man who was really digging graves for the dead. Yes. And so it was totally an uneducated. Mm. So it was totally 
out of his realm of comprehension. Yes, it and was. And he thought, are they playing with me? Mm, naturally. But then he also decided to join the spiritualist group, and they worked out people, several different peoples with their energies. And Leslie and these people, by trial and error, was a good group of people with like-minded thinking. They sat there for seven years, once a week, yes, to develop the energy, and they gave the energy to Leslie. They weren't interested in developing themselves. They were really interested in developing Leslie and that gift. Yes, it's called a home circle for people who are not familiar with it, right. a spiritualist home circle. Right. And that is the way in which all the great mediums of the past developed in the privacy and, and the comfort and the peace of their own home with a group of compatible and harmonious friends or family. Exactly. Mm. So he did this for seven years, and little by little, it became stronger and stronger. He used to be out of it completely, and the voices would start developing. But ultimately, he was able to partake in the seances and actually speak to spirit uh, and listen at the same time, because basically they utilized his ectoplasm. Yes, and of course it was difficult for him, but when there was a, a person in the seance room who was deaf, little Mickey, whose voice mm -hmm. box would materialize just above Leslie's left shoulder, would yell at the person uh, who was deaf so that they could hear him. And Leslie would jump and he would say, oh, Mickey, oh, Mickey, don't shout. It would make Leslie rather nervous and jumpy yes. when the voice of Mickey was shrill and loud across the room. Leslie was very protective of Mickey. Yes, he was. In more than one way. He encouraged Mickey to go on or at there are times Leslie would say, come on, Mickey, be a good boy, be a good boy, because he was so hoping that the communication would come through that particular evening. Mm. And Mickey had just a fabulous sense of humor as well. I mean, both of them really did. Oh, yes. And when you consider how many people actually came through these seances, famous and not so famous people, it's pretty surprising. And I would encourage anyone who is interested in this subject to really take a look at what this man did with his life work, the communication that came through, the book that he wrote, yes. uh, Voices in the Dark. And now, of course, uh, because, thank God, Leslie and his associate, Bram Rogers, taped every seance that there ever was. So there's a huge library with uh, through the Leslie Flint Trust in London. And uh, if you're interested, you can see all of the information, including interviews that Leslie gave at uh, www.lesleyflint.com. And that's... L-E-S-L-I-E-F-L-I-N-T. Thank you for spelling that out, Ursula. You're quite right. An amazing collection of these spirit voices have now been put on the Internet for anyone to download and listen on their own home computer. The voice of Charlotte Bronte, the voice of Mahatma Gandhi, the voice of this little black girl from the Deep South who picked right. cotton and she mm -hmm. couldn't read or write. She went up to heaven. And she didn't see no one with no wings up there and she thought she'd gone to the wrong place. <laughs> anyway, she has a little school up there, so she says, and she teaches little kids that die their ABC. And she says, I love education. I love education. Mm -hmm. She says with her funny voice. And it was delightful. And the little boy, Bobby Tracy, who died in a car accident with his mummy and... Oh, I go to school over here, and I learn art and drawing, and my teacher says I have good perspective. Mm -hmm. He meant perspective, of course. Right. And then he goes into details about how he and mummy go down to the earth, and we go to see daddy sometimes, but he's with another lady now. <laughs> Very funny. There's also, by the way, a wonderful tape of a man n uh, known as Lord Birkenhead. Yes. Now, this is your good subject because you're very much interested in this uh, concerning yes. the death penalty. Yes. Lord Birkenhead, his name actually was uh, Frederick Smith. And what did he do on earth? He was uh, known as the Hanging Judge. The Hanging Judge. In wow. England. That is quite a name, isn't it? Yes. But much to his dismay, and he came through in a seance with Leslie, he had terrible regrets about what he did. Really? And his regret was that he saw things completely different now that he was on the other side. I bet he did. And he begged people, uh, this was uh, primarily in England at the time, to stop capital punishment. He said, I have seen, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I've seen the effects on this side of life. These poor, unfortunate souls must find a way in which they can be repaid to have their own salvation on earth. They should be used to 
or be of service to work out their own salvation. Yes. And he said, I beg of you, I plead with you, do everything in your power to abolish capital punishment. And there was a gentleman who actually worked with Lord Birkenhead who said after the end of the seance, that's Birkenhead all right. He recognized the voice. The characteristics were there Absolutely. in the communication, yes. And what happened, I believe, is afterwards this communication went up the chain of command and ultimately capital punishment was in fact abolished in England. Yes. Uh, yes. What Lord Birkenhead actually did say also was he had seen the effects on this side of life and he said what happens is these people who are put to death, he said, whether through a hangman's noose or through any other more humane method, nothing justifies taking the life inside or outside the law, which is pretty remarkable, considering that this recording was in the late 40s yes, or early 50s. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've seen the effects on this side of life. These people are totally unprepared as they're being put to death. And what happens is they're so angry that they cannot work out their salvation that they then impinge their thoughts on weaker souls on earth. That's a very important thing to consider, isn't it? To duplicate the kind of uh, crime that they committed. Now, it happens to be a personal strong point of mine because it always takes me back to Andrea Yates, who took her children. This was a 90-pound woman who drowned a 12-year-old child, I believe, her oldest oh, son was yes. 12. Yes. And I always ask myself, where did this woman ever get that kind of energy to do this? Yes. And the first thought always was that communication of Lord Birkenhead and how these angry souls on the other side impinge their thoughts. And in fact, I also believe Andrea Yates also said she heard voices. Yes, and that is why people should not play party games, you know, with Ouija boards when they've had a lot of drink or they've been on drugs because yes. then their own energy field, their, their bioelectrical aura is weakened by yes. the drugs and the alcohol and they can easily be influenced by these unpleasant, undesirable earthbound entities because not everybody over there is is good and that is why at every proper seance they say prayers for protection and you have to have the right attitude of mind That's and then you exactly get the, right. as you think so do you attract and if you're thinking the right thoughts then the right kind of spirits come in exactly if, it, if you're not watch out <laughs> and if you listen to a number of these seances i think they were all meant to help humanity yes. number one yes. i think there's a strong parallel of what the tapes actually do say or what spirit world tries to communicate and what is written in most religious books. Yes, I think so too. Which is a forgiveness and kindness and do good work. It makes a great deal of sense, doesn't it, Ursula? Exactly, and it mm. also confirms, and this is being also said many times in my father's house are many mansions, right. meaning the levels of consciousness or the level of earning. Yes, the development of what you can create by your own work here on earth. Mm -hmm. I truly would encourage anyone who has an interest in the subject or subject matters because it's such a broad scale of information through the trust of Leslie Flynn to really take a look what's available because the knowledge is just invaluable. Outstanding. It is absolutely something that mm. um, they even talk about how to develop and what you must do in order to develop. Yes. So if you want to develop your own gift, which we all have, because as someone once said to me, God's not out there, my child, God's within you. Exactly. And again, it's a different paraphrase mm. as to what's in the Bible, but it basically comes out the same way. It does, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. And of course, people, uh, what the public doesn't realize is that people often continue with their own earthly brainwashing for a time on the other side, still believing the dogma that they've been taught down here. Exactly. And that's the thing. And then eventually when they get up there, they realize people of other religious persuasions are also in heaven. And they realize they were brainwashed by their own particular, you know, organized religious viewpoint. There's a wonderful tape of, I believe it was Brother Barnabas who talks about what prayer actually means. And there's one line that always sticks out in my mind, which is, 
prayer is not the genuflecting of the knee. No. <laughs> and exactly. it just hit very hard because I was raised Roman Catholic. Yes. And so I was able to identify with that very quickly because, in fact, that is what you're taught. Yes, you are. But he yeah. goes at great length of what prayer actually does mean. Mm. And it's not something that you think about just for a day because you can hear this over and over. And every time you hear it, you understand more. You see another aspect of it all. And you really start to see that the world is very gray. Yes. Fantastic. Well, you have given us something to think about, Ursula. I'm so glad you came here. Well, thank you. And it was quite an exciting and interesting thing. I know that we do have some of the amazing spirit voices to play. And um, possibly, I think one of the most interesting ones that I heard that, uh, that has moved so many people uh, was the voice of a Dr. Nanji, an Indian doctor who was sitting with Leslie to communicate with his deceased wife, who was Swedish. And uh, he had a number of sittings with Leslie Flint. And the voice of Dr. Nanji talking to his wife is just amazing. I mean, she didn't want to leave him. She was in spirit all around him in the laboratory. And she was watching the books that he read. And the voice is so amazing. And I think we can perhaps have an example of that now. Oh, goodness me. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Thank you, darling. I, it, it makes me happy to know that. Do you sometimes feel me put my hand through your hair? Yes, but... Uh, you don't know if it is I so. I don't huh? know it is. Uh, well, I sometimes I, when you are quiet, you know, mm. I come to you and I put my hand in your hair yeah. and sometimes I put my hand in yours. Mm. And one morning you wake up mm. and I feel sure you must have known yeah. I was there. And I felt sure that you must have felt my hand. When you do tapping, I always feel... You hear and know. Yes. The I, I feel in the evening before I go to bed, yeah. you have come yeah, to yeah, yeah. take me with you. I do, I <laughs> do. And you come here at night with yes, me, and we are together. Yes. Just like, but you kiss me good night every night. Yes, I do. I, I know. I can't sleep without you. I know. And I kiss you good night, uh, good morning when I leave the I know, the I know. Yes. And you, uh, but you know when you go out of the flat in the morning, yes. I sometimes go with you and yes. walk along the street. Yes, I, I feel that. And sometimes I come to you in the laboratory. Yes, I feel that. I you know. are, you know, sometimes when you are a little puzzle perhaps or something. I feel you are I try to help you. I feel you are helping me to open the book and put the right page in my hand. I do. I sometimes yes. find for you the exact page. Yes, I, I wonder how long I've got to wait for you. <coughs> you are so fit and healthy. Oh, but I think you're going to live many years. Mama, don't say that. I hope you <laughs> won't. That is being personal. Yes, yes. But I love you so much I want you to come that out to me. Yes. But I know that time, you have to fulfill your time on earth. Yes, and after all, perhaps in that time, who knows, perhaps you can do a lot to help other people and yes. give them comfort like you have had for me. Yes. And that is what we must think about. Exactly. Perhaps one day you will write the book, huh? And yes, who knows, I'm, this yes. business that we have talked about, yes. perhaps a few. I think, I think so many people here today, uh -huh. more than usual. Why? I don't know. I think it is that we, I, I know why in a way, because of us and because, um, you know, it is that people are interested and they are very good to friends, yes. some of them, of course, they come yes. with me, but a lot of strangers here today, yeah. I think they are attracted, you know, yes. because they know this possibility of communication, you know, yes, and I right. think that it attracts them and they like to stand yes. and listen. Yes. And perhaps they can, perhaps, who knows, yes. learn something. Yes. And perhaps they will have an opportunity yes. later to talk to their own people. Exactly. I would like to feel so. Yes. Oh, exactly. there is so much sadness with people here oh, when yes. they cannot find a way to get in touch, you know. Yes. They long to speak to their loved ones. They yes. love to tell them they are alive mm. and well and happy. And, uh, well, it is very sad when you think there are millions of people in your world who don't know, who don't understand. That is where we must try to help them on both sides, huh? 
Yes. Oh, my anniversary is soon here, huh? Darling, your yeah. anniversary is in July, but it's I know. two months from now. July? Yes. Oh. July the 14th. You will come? Oh, perhaps you cannot come. No, darling, I, I, I could come, but... Uh, but what? Miss, Mr. Flint is busy with American uh, people. Oh, coming. but surely he can find time for us? Yeah. <laughs> I will Surely. I will Mr. Have. Flint. Yes, of course I, I will. I will make every effort. Thank oh, you. so please, if you would. Oh, yes. It means so much to us, does it not, Dada? Yes, darling. Oh, perhaps it is expensive for you. No, no, expenditure doesn't matter. Oh. It's not much expenditure to me. No. Because I'm... It is a... I'm only... Perhaps I am being selfish. No, but darling, it's no. It's so wonderful. <laughs> and I feel so... Oh, I don't know. Of course, I can't come and see you every day, and I do. Yes. And I know you receive my thoughts and impressions and yes. everything. But when I can talk to you like this, this is well, oh, it is so wonderful, you know. Because I can't think how how people manage to live without it. Yes, darling. Uh, when people are so sad and lonely and unhappy and they don't understand and they grieve and. We have so blessed you and me. Yes, I know. Many people have found that tape rather amusing. Because of her extreme love and possessiveness for, for her husband, I remember Leslie himself telling me that Mr. Nanji, Dr. Nanji, I should say, sat with him many times, and that he said that was exactly the way his wife spoke. So there we had a husband validating the deceased wife's voice. And, of course, Leslie Flint had never met Mrs. Nanji, who was Swedish, and that's why she had an accent. But it's a very entertaining and a very amusing tape also, and shows the great love uh, this woman had for her husband. Uh, this is Brian Edward Hurst, and I've been speaking to you on ESP Radio, which is brought to you by ESPConnections.com. I do hope you have enjoyed the contributions by Ursula Rieg and our talks about Leslie Flint, the famous British medium. He was just an astounding man. Everyone should know about him. And www.lesleyflint.com is the place to look, where you can hear for yourself some amazing examples of these wonderful voices from the next world. Thank you and bless you.